Well, good morning and welcome once again to our wonderful New Life live stream service. Um, as you know, we pray that this uh, service would be a, a stream of life uh, from heaven to earth and that uh, this morning's service will touch all of our hearts and all of our minds. A special welcome if you're new today and uh, if you are, uh, you'll see on the, the uh, YouTube page at the top um, a little tab that says New Life website, hopefully, um, uh, or down below. Um, click on that. It'll take you through to uh, the menus. Click on the Contact Us one, fill in the details, and we will be very happy to get in touch with you. And it's been great to be able to get in touch with people that way. We had somebody a couple of weeks ago asking if they could come on the Alpha course. Um, others saying they want someone to talk to. So do make use of that if you're new today or indeed if you're not new. Don't forget to say hello on the YouTube chat. Um, it's a very nice way to make the service a little bit more interactive when we're talking to each other on that. Um, uh, as you know, if you've been before, this is a family service. And the idea really is that all of us, adults, children, teenagers, that we can all find something that we can engage with. Um, and so we have uh, lots of uh, interesting and fun things. Uh, we have an, a children's action song. We have the final episode of the Gladys Aylward story. And at the end, of course, we had that famous grabber prize. And I believe that we have uh, Lola the lovely rabbit reappearing to help Michelle with this, um, this great event. But before that, um, and uh, more importantly, we have um, our uh, Road to Calvary series. And uh, this week we've actually reached Calvary itself. Calvary was the hill where Jesus died. And our verse to for today reflects that. Let me read it out to you. Christ also suffered for sins once, the righteous for the unrighteous. That means the, the good for the bad, that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 3 verse 18. Why don't you read that with me this morning if you're sitting at home? Let's read this out aloud. Christ also suffered for sins once the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. In a moment, we're going to sing our first song, which is In Christ Alone, that beautiful song. And as we sing this, let's remember um, that Christ died so that we could have this communion with him to bring us literally to God, to present us to God. And he loves to hear our voices, whether in prayer or in praise. So let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you that you sent your only son to this earth because you loved us and because you wanted him to bring us to you. Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed to enable that joining of us with you today. Father, give us a spirit of praise, a spirit of prayer, a spirit of worship this morning. Father, would you reveal yourself to us as we engage with you in worship now, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Lord Jesus, thank you for the covenant that you have made with us through your own blood. Amen. Amen. Well, we've got a very special story today. It was recorded about 60 years ago, and you'll soon guess who it is. And then Joe's going to tell us uh, the final episode in the amazing story of Gladys Aylward. And before that, uh, we'll have um, today's um, action song, um, which is Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus. Hopefully by now uh, you're beginning to learn some of the actions uh, so that when we get back to face Uh, to face church will be very active in our praises so uh, let's praise him some more
the tenth verse of the third of Malachi. The great over and above all one, Jehovah, who controlleth the host, leans, saying, If you will bring into my storehouse your completed tithe, that my family may be sustained, then you can prove me, and see if I will not open wide windows in heaven, pouring out blessings so many, you will never be able to use them all. If you will bring, says God, into my storehouse, your completed cup, and you will find, as I have found, that your completed tithe as mine is this. This is Gladys L. The completed task, Master. All I possess, all I have, my head, my heart, my feet, my hands, that that is me, my completed task. And when God asks us to do something, he doesn't ask for one hand or one foot or even one day, he asks for the complete you. Exactly 36 years ago, I went uh, as a girl in my 20s, and I really and truly believed that God told me to go. I was saved, not in my home, I'm terribly sorry to have to say, but after I'd left my home and gone up to work in London, and uh, I was pulled into a church one night by a group of young people who were standing outside that church door. And I that night sat in that church and for the first time in my life realized that Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, had died for Gladys Ed. It shook me, it moved me, and it was going to alter my whole life. Well, this is the final part of the Gladys Aylwood story. And I just want to very quickly thank Phil um, for the amazing work he's done in bringing this story alive with the pictures and how he's made them move. It's just been really fantastic. I've loved watching it back uh, because then I see it with all the pictures. And um, we know the story now. Uh, that this young girl from North London went out on that Trans-Siberian Railway all the way to China with no money um, and no missionary society. And there she works in this inn, this inn of eight happinesses. And there they tell the story um, of Jesus, how he now walks among the angels, but they tell the men he once walked upon the earth to die for our sins. And Gladys settled out there and we've told the story of the Mandarin and the foot inspector, how she became uh, a Chinese citizen, how she set up the orphanage um, and the prison work out there. And then how in 1938, the beginning of the Second World War and how there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Christians at that time, how the Mandarin came and said that her God had become his God and how she then read that Bible verse, flee into the mountains, and she knew for the sake of the children and their lives, they'd got to cross over uh, on this high mountain pass to get out from this area where the, the big Japanese invasion of China was happening. So they go on that extraordinary journey, her and 94 children among the many teenagers, um, and they travel for 12 days, reaching that yellow river where that girl challenges her and says, God's power is not diminished. He helped people then, he can help us now. And how that Chinese captain heard them singing, count your blessings, came down and in that impossible situation, took them across that river. They journeyed on altogether. It was a 300 mile journey. They went on those refugee trains. They stopped at those refugee centers. They ended up on a, on a coal truck traveling across together. And finally they reached Xi'an only to be told you can't come into the city. They travel on 
It takes them 27 days, the whole journey, and they reach Fufeng and safety. Uh, they've got beds, they've got food, they can be looked after there, and many of them went into orphanages there. And that night Gladys read out Psalm 23, didn't she, that God uh, was their shepherd. Not long after that, she became very sick. She was they, she was told later that she had a number of things wrong with her, including pneumonia and typhus. Uh, but once she'd recovered, she settled in Siam with the five adopted children. She then moved southwest to this city of Chengdu, where really she spent many, many years, uh, where they worked among the lepers in that leper colony. Uh, many of the lepers became Christians, began to pray for that prison. There was that amazing work in the prison in Chengdu and that extraordinary story of the man in his shackles and his chains around his neck and his arms and his feet and how uh, he had an encounter with Jesus and they could not explain it but when they found him the next day he the chains had come off he was holding his locked chains that caused a huge stir in both the prison and the city that amazing story of how she went into that wilderness area and met with those 500 Buddhist priests where they stayed for a week and they were asking this question question will you explain to us why Jesus Christ died many of them became Christians. She was out there for 17 years. She ended up uh, in that Methodist church, which they renovated in that city of Chengdu with a, an incredible pouring out of the Holy Spirit with many hundreds becoming Christians, including many university students. And it was there she met the American missionary um, who said to her, have you heard of this person called our way day? And she said, I am our way day. Um, and he asked her how long since she went home? And she said, 17 years. And his wife had been raising money um, and incredibly had money left to uh, they, it was to bring uh, missionaries home and they were able to pay for her passage back home. She travelled via Shanghai where she met up with Ninepence uh, who was now a mother and she met others of the children who'd been on that journey um, and communism was closing China down at that time and so in the spring of 1949 she returned she's got no, no money to speak of no possessions, no British citizenship no property. She said I came back to England with absolutely nothing but the knowledge that God had never failed me. There must have been a lot of shouting and I would think tears on that Liverpool Street station as they met. Um, her parents didn't recognise her, she didn't recognise her parents, but they all got together in the end. It was our glad, as they called her, she'd returned home. So she returned to 67 Cheddington Road where she'd grown up in Edmonton. Uh, she promised her mother that she wouldn't go back to China while her mother was still alive and she began a work among the displaced Chinese, many of whom were fleeing from the communism in China. Um, and there were also many invitations came for her to tell her story. And so she began to travel around telling her story in the UK and people were mesmerised that she was actually a brilliant speaker. Uh, they all wanted to hear about this girl who'd gone on this extraordinary journey. In 1957, her mother died and um, she decided that she wanted to go back to China, but she wasn't allowed to because of uh, the communist revolution that had happened there. And so in April 1957, she decides to go to Hong Kong because that was the closest she could get. Just before she left the UK, a man called Alan Burgess uh, wrote a book together with her called The Small Woman and it told the story and it was an almost instant bestseller. It was read worldwide, uh, so much so that 20th Century Fox, the filmmakers, uh, bought the rights to the book. She signed them off. She didn't know that it meant anything or was of any value um, and they made a film. Uh, now, a pretty famous film called The Inn of the Six Happinesses. Um, it was released in 1958. Uh, Gladys never saw it. She didn't like the fact that it had been made into a love story. But it's actually a brilliant film. And it does actually, um, although it doesn't mention Jesus nearly enough, um, it does really bring the story to life and it's worth watching. But it's very long. So you've got to, have a, a, you've got to start early in the evening to watch it. Um, the, the, the film and the book gave her worldwide fame, fame she'd never sought, but she began to travel right out across the world, supported by World Vision. Um, she went to, to Europe, Asia, North America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Um, all over the world, people wanted to hear this story of this London maid who'd uh, been used by God in China. Uh, these are some of my favourite things that are quoted as her having said, I believe that God has called you and me not to walk on a nice rosy path, but to walk the way that he walked, the road to Calvary. 
She said to young people, God will not be asking you for your exam results and your certificates. He will only ask you if you have been faithful to his call on your life. She wrote, my heart is full of praise that one so insignificant, so uneducated and so ordinary in every way could be used for his glory. Well, she wasn't allowed to stay in Hong Kong incredibly because she wasn't a British citizen, because she'd become Chinese. And so she moved across to the island of Taiwan, which was then known as Formosa, which was opposite China. You can see on the map here. In between travelling um, and speaking, she established an orphanage in Taiwan and adopted a little boy called George who travelled extensively with her. And then in 1963, she needed more funds for this orphanage in Taiwan. They needed to move to a new building and she thought, I want to return to the UK and she didn't have any money to do that. So she began to pray that God would provide the money and incredibly the BBC wrote her a letter knowing nothing of this. She gets this letter and it says, we'd like to fly you back over to the UK and we want to do some recording with you. And so she flew back over. Here's a picture of her arriving at the BBC at that time. What she didn't know was actually it wasn't uh, a recording with her. It was a recording about her. And they were going to surprise her with a this is your life. If you're younger, uh, you're, you won't have a clue what that is. But this is your life was a program done about sort of famous people where they sort of told their life story and brought all the people from their life all back together again and it was an incredible evening here's a picture of the end of that evening um, and they brought over some of the children who had been well they were adults now but who had been on that walk with her in that same visit in 1963 she was invited to have lunch with the queen at buckingham palace what an amazing thing she went um she didn't say very much about what they all talked about but i cannot believe that she didn't talk about jesus um, she sat with Prince Philip and spoke with him um, and and had this, this time at the palace with them, gave them a gift from Taiwan, from the orphans, which apparently is still there. The Queen made it into um, a, a fire screen uh, because she liked it so much. Always George was with her. And then on January the 3rd, 1970, age 67, Gladys Aylward died in her sleep out in Taiwan, having gone to bed that night saying to her friend that she didn't feel very well. Uh, a week or so later at her funeral, a thousand people gathered in the big cathedral in Taipei. Among them were a num numbers of the children with whom she'd walked across the mountains all those years before. Memorial services were held for her worldwide and she lies buried in the grounds of Christ College Taipei and they, they laid her grave facing towards China. In London, two places remain in her memory. Uh, one is um, the school uh, in North London, her original school, which is called Silver Street School, that she went to, changed its name when she died. There was a new building by then, um, and they called the school the Gladys Aylwood School. Here's a picture of it. Yeah, It's now known as the Aylwood Academy, and on the website it states, um, we are deeply proud of our association with Gladys Aylwood. Um, and then the website tells the story. Uh, Cheddington Road, number 67, still stands with a blue plaque. Uh, Elaine and Kevin went um, and saw it two weeks ago. This is the house where she grew up. This was the house where her father said to her, you're not, you, you, what can you do? All you're good for doing is talking. Um, and that's what she'd done. If you go out to Yang Chen, um, you can see still on a wall this sign. Um, I love this. Um, it's, it's a sign marking and pointing out where that Jesus courtyard is. The old Jesus Hall courtyard is still marked there. And also one of the entrances to the inn still stands there uh, to this day in Yang Chen. But her lasting memorial has to be the many hundreds, maybe it was thousands, um, who turned to Jesus um, as she talked to them. Um, and as she talked and talked and talked like she said she would about Jesus. I feel so challenged myself by this story and so convicted by her life and how she lived for God. Um, and my favourite quote um, was really where she tells the story and she says that she thinks that God looked down in the 1930s and thought, I want someone to go to China. Uh, and then she said, maybe he thought, there's Gladys Aylward, at least she's willing how willing am I? How willing am I? Let's just pray. Oh God, uh, we want to be willing. We want you to look down and think, oh, there's that person. At least they're willing. 
Jesus, would you make us willing to tell this story? Would you uh, cause this story of Jesus that filled her heart to fill our hearts in a new way? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. Wow, amazing story. I love those words. There's Gladys Aylward. At least she's willing. Father, we just pray this morning, Lord. We thank you that Gladys Aylward was, was not special. She just was willing, Lord, and you had a plan for her life. Lord, we are no less significant, Lord. Uh, you have a plan for our lives too, Lord. It's not her plan, it's your plan for us, Lord, but we want to be willing, Lord. Father, we offer ourselves to you today. Make us willing, Lord. If we are not willing, make us willing, we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. Wow. What a story. What a story. Ruth's going to share now um, uh, a thought on the Lord's Prayer uh, for a blaze. Um, before Monica um, uh, does today's reading. And after that, uh, we have another opportunity to worship our magnificent God. And uh, we're going to sing uh, with uh, Johnny and Leone, we're going to sing uh, that uh, beautiful song, Build My Life. And I find this song touches my heart because there's a, a prayer in the middle of that that starts. Um, how does it start? It says, show me who you are. Show me who you are. We're going to look at the cross after that. And as we do, let's pray this prayer, Lord. Show us the cross. Help us to understand. Show us who you are. Show us your nature. Show us your love. Show us your power. Show us your holiness. Show us your justice. Show us your glory. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. What this passage is trying to say to me is that God will not allow us to fall into the enemy's temptation, but rescue us from the devil's plan and what is going on around us. I'm reading from Mark chapter 15, starting at verse 22. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God.
Seven weeks ago, we started our Road to Calvary series at the Mount of Transfiguration, where we found Moses and Elijah, who represented the Old Testament law and the prophets, discussing with Jesus the greatest event in history, his departure in Jerusalem, the cross. And as Jesus was revealed in his true glory, we heard the Father speaking from heaven, about his son. This is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And he was telling the three disciples to listen to Jesus, because Jesus through the cross was about to fulfill the law and the prophets and supersede everything that had gone before. And then we watched him arrive in Jerusalem to the adulation of the fickle crowd. An unlikely king riding on a donkey rather than on a white horse, as you might expect. And only a few days later, we see that same crowd baying for his blood. And then we traveled to a village in Jerusalem called Bethany, where we saw Jesus portrayed as worthy of everything most precious as we watched a grateful and adoring and weeping Mary do a beautiful thing and pour out her very precious ointment on his feet in preparation for his burial. Soon afterwards, we were ushered into the upper room to watch the disciples taking the Passover meal where Jesus revealed himself as Christ, our Passover, the Lamb, who would bring forgiveness and an amazing new agreement through the shedding of his own blood and the breaking of his own body. 
And then we saw him washing their feet, revealing the nature of God as humble and gentle instead of proud and loving instead of selfish and illustrating our need to humbly and continually receive his cleansing and power in order to be part of his project and then to serve others in the same way. I remember a few years ago seeing that the cross was not only an event in history that Jesus accomplished, but that the spirit of the cross was always in Jesus. It was like uh, the shoulders and the spine of the human body kind of hold up um, <clears throat> the body in some way. And you could kind of see that spirit of Christ all the way through his life. From the time when, in his childhood, he said to his mother, I must be about my father's business. And when he said to his followers, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Someone has described the cross that we carry as where our will is crossed by God's will. But Jesus always chose his father's will above his own. The spirit of Calvary ran through his veins. Last week, Mauricio showed us in the Garden of Gethsemane this very point. We saw Jesus as so human, honestly saying that he didn't want to drink that cup of the wine of his father's righteous anger and asking his father if there was any other way this could be accomplished and then bowing his will to the will of the father and saying, not my will, but yours be done, and choosing to drink the cup. This is where the battle was won, in prayer, that is in honest communication. Jesus was so honest about the way he felt, honest communication with his Father, and then making the right choice. And having made the right choice, we read that afterwards the angels came and strengthened him. There's a lesson here for us. As we face our challenges, let us spend time with God. Let's be honest with him about our challenges and he'll help us to make the right choice and we'll receive grace for the journey. The disciples slept when they should have prayed and they failed. Jesus prayed and succeeded. So now we're at Calvary, looking at Jesus who has been tempted in every way, just like us, yet without sin. The proven, perfect, spotless Lamb of God, now dying in the place of countless sinful men and women, including you and including me. We're joining the scene at midday, halfway through this six-hour ordeal. Already Jesus has been falsely accused, falsely judged, mocked, spat at and beaten up so that his face is unrecognisable. Whipped within an inch of his life, nailed, probably naked, to a cross and bearing a crown of thorns thrust down upon his head. Unimaginable pain. The crucifixion was the longest and most excruciatingly uh, and painful form of execution that the Romans could think up. I mention these things um, because the Bible mentions them. And obviously God wanted us to be aware of the horrific sufferings of the cross. Why did it have to be so brutal? Have you ever thought that? Why did it have to be so painful physically, mentally, emotionally? Maybe because Jesus wanted us to know that in his love, he suffered every kind of pain that human beings would go through, yet without giving up. Maybe because he wanted us to know um, how much he loved us. Certainly that is true. For greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And then... At midday, something remarkable begins to happen. The sky begins to cloud over until a deep darkness falls upon the whole land. This was recorded by a Roman historian called Phlegon. 
He said there was an extraordinary eclipse of the sun at the sixth hour. The day turned into dark night, so that the stars in heaven were seen, and there was an earthquake. And now we hear Jesus crying out these incredible words, which are written in Hebrew. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or as we might say, why have you abandoned me? Abandonment, rejection, that feeling of being alone, having once been closely bonded, is a terrible thing. The psychological effects of abandonment are well known to a psychologist, but none of us enjoy that feeling of being let down by people we trust, by, be feeling, by feeling abandoned by people we are close to, rejected by people we respect. Jesus had already been betrayed by Judas, abandoned by his disciples, disowned by Peter and rejected by the crowd. But what is happening uh, now is far worse to him. Let's just consider that in all eternity up to this point, Jesus had never been separated from his father. And the fellowship he had enjoyed with the Father and the Holy Spirit was of a depth that we can only imagine. The greatest and most joyful friendships um, that you have ever seen or I have ever seen or experienced are only a shadow of the fellowship enjoyed by the Godhead. We get an inkling of this in the book of Proverbs, which says this in chapter 8 describing the sun at the dawn of creation. Then I was beside him, like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. And when Jesus speaks to his father, he doesn't speak in grand, formal, distant words. He calls him Abba Father. Daddy God is the nearest we get to it, informal affectionate, close. And in his earthly walk, Jesus utterly depended on his father. He was in constant communion with him. He never did anything he didn't see his father doing and he never said anything he didn't hear his father saying. They walked together. And then at the baptism of Jesus, as the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, descends like a dove on the Son. The Father says, as he did on the Mount of Transfiguration, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Or as one translation puts it, This is my Son, the dearly loved, in whom is my delight. Whenever we hear the audible voice of the Father in the Gospels, we hear these same words, Beloved, Son, Delighted. John summed it up in the first words of his Gospel. He said, In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. God. Amazing. He was always with him. He was never apart from him. And this withness is the relationship that God has planned to have with you and I. In Genesis 1 verse 26, this three in one God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So the three in one creates a two in one who would fill the earth with this incredible example of harmony. Genesis 1.27 says this, So God created man in his own image. The image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And unlike the animals that were uh, not created to fellowship with God, we were created as spiritual beings, as God breathed into us the breath of life. Like Enoch, 
we would be individual beings that could walk with God. But they gave it all away. Satan was given a choice. And he had separated himself from the unity of the angelic host and was allowed onto this earth to give us a choice. And we too chose to rebel. And the worst part of the curse that fell upon us at that time was the curse of separation. As Isaiah said, your sins have separated you and God. Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, separated from the perfection and beauty of God, from his purpose and provision, from love and joy and peace. But most of all, they were separated from God himself. The God and his love would not allow this separation to continue. And even as Adam and Eve received their judgment, a saviour is promised. A lamb was set apart to take the punishment on himself. And he shall bruise your head, God said to the serpent. And so this is what we are seeing happen now on Calvary. Maybe this is the point where, as the prophet Isaiah put it, he laid on him the iniquity of us all. Because somewhere in this six-hour crucifixion, that is exactly what happened. Spurgeon says that the darkness is the symbol of the wrath of God which fell on those who slew his only begotten son. God was angry and his frown removed the light of day. Others have thought that the father didn't, couldn't bear to look upon the suffering of his son. Others have explained the darkness, quoting Habakkuk, you are of purer eyes than to see evil and you cannot look at wrong. But one thing we can be sure of is that Jesus felt abandoned by his father because our sin was being laid upon him. And then we reach the pinnacle of the story. At the end of the six hours, Jesus cries out, It is finished. The Greek word tetelestai means paid in full. This is because Jesus had fully paid the debt of sin he owed, and he finished the eternal purpose of the cross. And you know then something else remarkable happens. It says as Jesus uttered a loud cry, breathed his last, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The curtain of the temple separated man from the presence of God, except the high priest just once a year. And it was thought to be a, a hand breadth thick. That's about nine centimetres. So it was impossible like, a, like two or three telephone directories to, for a human being to rip through that. And just to make the point, it says that God tore the uh, veil from the top to the bottom. And this veil was 60 feet high. And all this so that you and I could be with God and God could be with us. As Paul said in Romans 5.10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. I'd like to finish this morning by um, trying to answer that question my God my God why have you forsaken me um, and Spurgeon Charles Spurgeon the famous uh, Victorian preacher uh, said this he said we can imagine the answer to Jesus's question why because my son you have chosen to stand in the place of guilty sinners you who have never known sin have made the infinite sacrifice to become sin and receive my just wrath upon sin and sinners. You do this because of your great love and because of my great love. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you, Father, that we have been reconciled to you by the blood of your Son. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus and allowing this to happen. Jesus, thank you for saying yes in the garden. Thank you, Lord. Help us to enjoy the fellowship that you have opened up to be praying people, Lord. And Lord Jesus, could you help us to be ministers of this reconciliation and empower us and equip us, Lord, as you open our eyes to it, to share this good news with others. Amen. Well, <clears throat> thank you for listening. Next Sunday, um, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together on Easter Sunday um, as a church family. And this is an opportunity to reflect on this wonderful thing that Jesus did, as well as on the uh, resurrection of the Lord. Um, <clears throat> I think Phil's going to put up a slide at the Lord's Supper next Sunday. Uh, it says, have some bread and wine ready. The first thing to say is uh, do try and be there. Um, I'm amazed that um, and thrilled that we have more people online this morning uh, than we normally do on a Sunday, and that with the hour of sleep that we lost. Uh, well, keep it up, guys, uh, because next Sunday it would be great to do uh, this together, to share the Lord's Supper, the taking of the bread and the wine together. So uh, if you have children, then uh, we allow you as parents to decide whether um, they uh, are uh, ready, uh, would understand, want to uh, join in. Um, but have your wine or your uh, black currant juice or whatever it is you use ready and some bread. And we're going to really enjoy as a, a church family taking the bread and the wine together as we remember the death of Jesus. It says that before we take the bread and wine, this is what um, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. It says, a person should examine himself first, and in this way, let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. And if you're not quite sure <clears throat> what that involves, then a good prayer to pray is the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139. He said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. There are three things there. Let's ask God during this week, Lord, uh, look at my heart. Where is my heart in relationship with you? Lord, show me um, if I'm trusting you, where I'm anxious. Uh, are there areas where I need to trust you more? And Lord, if there's anything in my life, uh, in my relationship with others, uh, in a blatant sin, is there anything in me that is offensive to you? Let's bring them to Calvary, bring them to him, confess our sins and be washed in his blood. Um, and then this Friday, which is Good Friday, um, we're going to do a new thing. We've not done this before. Um, but for those who would like to, um, Bob and I would, uh, are going to be online. Uh, we're going to read some scriptures. We're going to pray. We're just going to think about Jesus dying on the cross. It's going to be a time of prayer, reading and meditation. It won't be for long, definitely less than an hour. But if you'd like to, uh, to be with us instead of watching TV or whatever else it might be that you do, um, then we're just going to be there and we're going to enjoy that time together. And then this uh, Wednesday, we have our Bible study and we're going to look into this, this story of the, uh, the cross in more detail. And on Tuesday, on the same church Zoom number, 714-353-1948, we've got um, our prayer meeting. And so we're really looking forward to that. And a quick reminder of those of you um, who enjoy giving as part of your worship. The only way, unfortunately, at the moment we can do that is online. And the link is there on our website uh, if you would like to, to give. 
And then um, just to say that uh, after Easter, uh, we're planning to have a two week break from this uh, YouTube um, live stream service. And we'll be having um, small, uh, small group Sunday. And we'll be giving you more details of that during the next week. And then afterwards, we're going to have the, the final, what we really hope is the final season of these live stream services. Um, and if in the end we can be released into meeting uh, one another during that period, that's great. But our theme uh, is going to be the road to the promised land. So we've had the road to Bethlehem, the road to Calvary, and now, uh, fittingly, it's going to be the road to the promised land. It's going to be uh, uh, planning and preparing for what God has for us as we come out of this lockdown. Thank you so much for listening to the notices. I know it's not easy. And now, since Ginger, Ginger Beer, the guinea pig, um, uh, proved to be a little bit slow last week, uh, we brought Lola, lovely Lola, uh, Liston the rabbit has been brought out of her retirement uh, and she and Michelle are going to present the grabber prize and uh, show us some clips of your favorite animals. <laughs> Okay, good morning and welcome to the Flame Group. And this week's Grabber Prize is going to be picked out by our lovely little Lola, Lola Liston. And she's going to pick a film that we're going to watch tonight. Um, and we've got three films to choose. We've got The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. We've got Prince Caspian and The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And they're really exciting films written by C.S. Lewis, the books, original books, who was a, who was a Christian. So um, they're really excellent films and they've been made very well and made recently. So they're good quality, um, in case you want to watch one. Um, so Lola, which one are you gonna pick? Hey, which one are you gonna pick? So we'll let Lola pick her carrot. tonight. Okay, let's give you your carrot down here. It's going to fall on the floor. And who's that? Oh! The big surprise, and that was all the treats. Thank you. Wow, thank you um, for all those pictures. Thank you especially from Michelle, uh, an old member of New Life. I, I use the word old advisedly um, in Australia. And uh, love to you, Michelle, Bruce, and uh, all your growing family out there. Uh, love from New Life in London. 
Do join us after church, everybody, um, for the after church Zoom meetup hosted by the uh, wonderful Bob and the lovely Vicky. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And as our thought for the week, as we just finished now, um, let's take that uh, that that part of the Lord's Supper. Whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So let's remember Jesus this week. Let's make a special uh, effort this week to read those stories of the cross, maybe, and absorb all the wonder and the glory of the crucifixion. And I'm going to say goodbye now, um, and we're going to sign off uh, with um, a slightly updated version of Leone and Johnny um, uh, singing uh, the blessing. So have a really blessed week and see you next week bye